Welcome to Impact the World, the show for and about creatives, change makers, and entrepreneurs. This is a conversation episode where a special guest shares with me what they are creating and the behind the scenes journey of their experience. Hello, welcome to this special episode of Impact the World, which we are recording during the quarantine period. So my guest today is joining me via Zoom. And my guest is Rebecca Shaper, who is an author, a philanthropist, and a filmmaker. And Rebecca and I got connected a few years ago. And along the way, I learned that she had made this film called A Sister's Call about her experience with her brother, a documentary. The trailer alone uh, made me cry. So I knew that watching the movie was going to be a very moving experience, and so it was. So I brought Rebecca onto the show today to talk about why she made the movie and part of her journey through doing that. So, Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, Lee, it's so great being here with you. And thank you so much for having me. I'm just thrilled to be here. Well, it's it's my hope also that in you sharing your story that, you know, I know we'll have a lot of people listening, watching who are compelled perhaps to create something that's biographical. And I think it's a tricky thing to do. But in your circumstance, you've taken quite an extraordinary true life story, your own story and that of your family, and you've you've turned it into a documentary, which is incredible. But perhaps for those who don't know you and who haven't seen the documentary A Sister's Call or read the book, could you tell us a little bit about your brother Call and what the story of, of, of your life has been about with Call? Well, first of all, it was a soul calling. Um, and when my brother and I reunited after 20 years of him being homeless, I knew in my heart that I needed to be his voice and he could be my voice. I saw into his soul and not his disease. And what I mean by that, he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. And it was uh, a miracle how we found each other. Um, Would you like for me to elaborate more? Well, I, I would, but maybe first, how had he become homeless and you become estranged? How had that all happened? 1977, my mother died by suicide, and they had such a tight relationship, and he just couldn't take it anymore. There was a lot of chaos in the family when I was growing up, a lot of abuse, and I think that was the catalyst of him taking off, and he went missing for 20 years, but I always knew, Lee, that he was alive. Mm. I always knew he was alive. And I even tried to search for him, but I could never find him. And once in a while, he would pop up and then leave again. But again, I just knew that I would reunite with him at some point, but I didn't know how it was going to happen. And how did it happen? Because it's pretty extraordinary coincidence. (laughs) Well, um, he was staying at the Haven of Rest, which is in Anderson, South Carolina, and they take in people with mental illness. And um, what they do is they have the people drive to people's homes who are willing to give donations as far as furniture and take it back to the Haven of Rest thrift store because that's how they were able to get their money because it was a nonprofit organization. So my brother and another guy got into a truck and they drove to this house. My brother got out of the truck, went up to the door, knocked on the door, got the furniture and got back into the truck. He looked at the order form and it said shaper on it. He got out of the car, knocked back on the door and said, Marge, do you know who I am? I am Carl Richmond, Rebecca's sister. She goes, oh, my God. She said, come in, Carl. Do you know Rebecca's been looking for you for so long? Marge is my husband's mother. So that's how we reunited. I'll never forget that day. And what was your life like at that moment in time? 
So what was your situation, your family, I, what were you doing? Yeah, I was living in Atlanta, still married to my husband, Jim, and raising two daughters and, and living pretty much a normal life, doing a lot of volunteer work. And that was pretty much my life at that time. And then Cole came in and he became your new mission. Like, walk, walk, <laughs> yeah, walk us, walk us through that. Like I said, I saw into his soul. I knew I had to be his voice and he was my voice. And I wanted to give him the life that he never had with my parents. I wanted to integrate him into our family, which at the beginning was a little tough. Um, but um, after call built trust with my husband and my two girls and my husband built trust with call, we just embraced and we brought him into our home. We brought him to our beach house. Um, we would go up and visit him. Um, he just, um, it, it was, it was wonderful. It was beautiful. It really was. I, I just absolutely knew that he was such a kind soul and had so much compassion because there's a stigma around it, mm. you know? Yeah. Unfortunately, there is. And he, he's very creative. He was very creative. He loved music. I do believe that my brother, when we were growing up, that he picked up a lot of the chaos in my family because he is such an extremely sensitive soul. And he just picked everything up and he just couldn't deal with it. And maybe that was his breaking point. Yeah. And it's interesting, you know, watching the documentary, what happens to you in the documentary is he really does become a mission for you. Like, so for anyone who hasn't yet seen the documentary, number one, I highly recommend it. It's available on Amazon Prime and, and various other places. But what what really is evident to us is he he became a real almost obsession for you or at least you were accused of that by your own family so I guess first of all tell us what were you doing like on a daily basis to help him once he came back into your life well I was living in Atlanta and he was in Greenville and I would drive back and forth to make sure that he was okay I got him with the Greenville mental help system and Kathy, his social worker, was incredible. But still, there was that caretaker in me that I just wanted to make sure he was okay. And because of the way I lost my parents, I wanted me personally to help him in ways that he never got help while being on the street. And he just was... I think we had a soul agreement, a soul contract, no doubt about it, Lee. It, 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 I, I, I can't explain it except because of the passion and the drive that I had to help him. And I truly believe there was some type of, like I say, soul agreement, soul contract. And he not only helped heal us, but we helped heal him. Yeah. A lot of transformation in our family. Um, so it was it was pretty extraordinary how what a catalyst this was. And there's a period in the documentary where we start to watch you doing this drive because it was a long drive, wasn't it? The, the drive to Greenfield? Uh, two and a half hours. It was two, two and a half hours. Yeah. And so there comes this very pivotal scene in the documentary where you're all at the family dinner table and your girls, and to a degree also Jim, your husband, but there is a family reckoning around how much they feel like they've lost you to call. So mm -hmm. I'm curious, like how many months had your devotion to call been going on at that point when they kind of called you out on, you're not here for us? It's a very good question. The film took 14 years to to, you know, to produce. Mm -hmm. um, so probably 14 years. 
Right. Yeah. And it was a real shock for you. It was because I love my daughters. And as a mother, I would do anything in the world for them. And as I did, because, because I love them. And when they said that, I was taken back, but that's their perspective. I had, it took me a while to get over that, but it was their perspective and I had to validate it and um, let it go. It, it took a little while though, to be honest. Well, that's, I think anybody who's in a family or any kind of relationship, there's such an emotional resonance when you see that scene in the dinner table, because every, we've all been in that place where, you know, you're following something you feel compelled to follow. And then someone else turns around and tells you, I wish you hadn't, or I wish you, you know, it's, it, so I think we've all been there, but it, it was fascinating to be able to witness all of this because so much of your life was being filmed. So did you know you were making a documentary at the very beginning, or was it just that you happened to want to have a camera there documenting Call's return? How did that happen? So um, I'll start. I'll never forget it. I told Jim I wanted to tell my brother's story. And I literally went to my knees and just cried. I'm going to, um, and he said, it's all about you. I said, no, it's not. And um, so at that point, I got this little PDF camera. I didn't know anything about film. I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but I knew I had to do it. Hope that was okay. To say. Um, and that was it. So I drove to Greenville, saw a call, and I said, do you mind if I tell your story? And he said, absolutely not. I would love for you to. And I remember walking away thinking it was like he knew. It's like he knew that's what I was going to do. And so I started filming and then everything lined up. A a filmmaker came in for seven years and then another filmmaker came in after to finish um, after another seven years. But everything was so aligned. I I wish I had more time to to express how everything was so in line for this to happen. Um, It was incredible. I knew this was my part of my purpose. The film's not about me. It's about giving others hope. And and I have to say the film isn't about you. Um, you, you You don't come away. You are one of the characters in this story, but you are one of the characters. Mm -hmm. And I think what's so extraordinary Probably most of the people listening or watching this will not be at all surprised that you had a divinely guided vision that was then unfolding because that's how it works. It's, you know, it's, and and even calls knowing it's clear that there was a far bigger purpose at work here than your family's personal story and healing by documenting it and sharing it in the way that you have the effect for those of us that sit and watch the, the film is, is we have this, we have this shared experience with you. And I know that this has gone on to bring you into a lot of work with mental health and to be a a healing force for change and reform. So I'm curious, you didn't know what this was going to do, but what's your experience now you're on the other side of releasing the documentary and the book? How, How does it feel to you now knowing that you know, all of the people that this is affecting and having a a positive effect on? Oh, it just, it touches my heart. Um, The people who have reached out and has written me letters and, and, um, and, 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 you know, and I am instant messaging and they poured Mm -hmm. their heart out. I mean, they've told me stuff that they've never told anybody. And, I'm like, oh my gosh, they trust, they have that trust in me and I would never betray that. And any way I could give people support and inspire them um, and be a good listener. And I, that's what it's all about. Mm. But I'm still in the trenches of it because um, yes, the film and the book brought transformation and healing 
to my brother, Carl, who's now deceased, um, and myself and my family, I am uh, in the midst of doing another documentary on schizophrenia, the voices of, of schizophrenia. Um, and because this is, I feel that calling again. Yeah. And I can't, I can't shut the door on that. So things have been lining up for that. And so there you go. That's perfect. That's step two. It's like, you know, all we ever have to follow is step one. And if we feel compelled to step to create step one and we put it out into the world, then step two will follow and it will, it will speak to you at the right time. So I'm curious, you know, you talk about the, the way that people are writing to you. I'm not at all surprised because number one, just knowing you in person in the way that I have got to know you at certain times over the last few years, you and your family carry that signature. But I also feel that when you are that vulnerable, that naked, with your own emotional, let's say ups and downs, it's probably the best way I can think of describing it right now, and you share that with people in a, in a generous way with an intent to help them, I think it, 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 it mirrors that emotional trust in you. It's, ah, oh, okay, well, they're willing to go there emotionally. But the, the thing I want to ask you is, how do you turn around to your family and your extended family and any friends and anyone who might be involved in the movie and go, hey, guys, I'm going to put this out into the world and everybody is going to know our family secrets. Because I should say that a lot comes out about your childhood and um, the sexual abuse that was going on yes. that, that comes out later in the movie. And, and it's quite it was quite shocking to us because it was, you know, it's not the first half of the movie, but then the more you start to see what's there. So I'm curious, how did the people who weren't driven to make the documentary like you were feel about the fact you were about to put this out there and, and, and their life was going to potentially be public for anyone who viewed or aspects of their life? Um, well, my family was very supportive and my husband um, was a CEO of a very large company and he, he was very supportive and he's a rock. My, my family, I'm just so blessed to have, grateful to have the family that I do. But um, my younger brother and his family, they were a little hesitant because I was exposing a lot in the film. Um, and I, I could tell he was not happy about it, but he knew, he knows me. I'm going to do what I feel like needs to be done. And after a while, when, once he saw the film, realized what was going on, and the kids were a little bit older at that time because the, he has four kids, he embraced it more. And so now we have a great relationship, and he's all about it. But as far as it, anybody extended family, no. is mainly my brother. Yeah. And one of the greatest leaders and advocates for the film is actually your daughter, Kim, Yes. who she suffered from depression and anorexia and yep. is really a, a, the turning point in the film because while you were caring for Call and helping Call, her issues really fled up and came to the surface. Yeah, could you share a, an, a little bit about what went on for Kim and how that was for you when all that was going on? You're talking about the dinner scene? Yeah, it, well, it was... Prior to the dinner scene and then the dinner scene? Yeah, just just everything that, because in a way that just for me as a viewer, what happened was Kim's healing crisis rose to the surface yes. because of Cole's re-entry into the family and because of, so it was like this domino effect. Yes. That leads yes. us to understand, that leads, that leads to the uncovering of the, of the sexual abuse. Yes. So... That was how I was watching this domino effect of healing move around the, the, the family. But let's start with perhaps, you know, for anyone who hasn't seen the film, what happened for you when you found out about Kim's struggles, when they started to surface in a bigger way? She was in college and um, Jim and I went down 
and met her and she was like skin and bones and I, and we t we immediately got her out of college got her in the treatment center there were more treatment centers that she went to but we were appalled couldn't believe it so um she was in therapy and she asked me to come and I sat in the room with her and the therapist and the therapist told me that my father had abused her and um my heart my heart just broke um and um but it was good I'm, I'm glad she was able to get that out because it needed to be get out because I think that was part of what she was dealing with the the, the abuse. I had no idea my father would do something like that. Mm. I, it, it, I, yes, I was abused, but I didn't know what a pedophile was back then. I had no idea. I'd never in my life would have thought that he would have abused her. So um, as time went on, um, she was in and out of treatment, but we, our, our family wrapped our arms around her and tried to get her help as much as possible. And I took pictures of her. This is in the film. Because not to show it in the film, but because I wanted her to see where she was and where she is today. The person who she is today. And in the scene, Kim and I talk about it. But it took me 10 years to ask her. And I kept feeling this pull. I needed to do that. And we had a good conversation, a great conversation about it because I, she was in the healing process. I was in the healing process of in forgiving my father. And it was very transformative at that time. And um, now Kim is just thriving. Mm. She's thriving. I knew that she would be okay. I knew that she would be okay. I knew she could get through this, but so I hope that answered your question. It, it did. And, you know, you have two amazing daughters and what's great about Kim, which again, I think is testament to the, the strength in your family. And what's great about Kim is she has now turned her experiences. She is a, an incredible advocate out there now for, um, for body issues, body dysmorphia, hormones, helping people figure out their own healing around their body and their relationship to food. And because we met all together, I, I asked Kim to come on the show too. And we actually pre-taped her episode. So she'll be coming on soon to, to kind of share what she does in the world. But again, it's this, what I love about it, because I guess that's my story too. And the story of lots of people I know is those of us who need healing, find healing. And if it's our path and we're compelled to do it and we're able to do it, we can then kind of offer it out for other people. And so Absolutely. I do think that moment with Kim in the movie, which I, you know, I knew about because of knowing some of your personal story, but you don't see it coming. And what it leads to is just, it's like the rug gets pulled up and so much starts to make sense. Um, and so that was this enormous healing that takes place. Yes. And, and another reason why we decided to do it is so other mothers could talk and feel comfortable talking to their daughters. Yeah. Because there's so much of that that goes on. And um, that, was, that was another purpose too. I mean, there's a lot in the film, but it's, it's to give others hope through love, forgiveness, and compassion. Mm. And, and holding space for those kinds of difficult conversations, which in a way you giving us a window into, into your world really did. So Rebecca, I have to ask you, because I know you as a very courageous person, but one of the questions I like to ask many of the guests on the show is, were you afraid, you know, to put this, because I think whether it's 
a documentary about your life and your family, or whether it's standing in your work publicly on social media for the first time, or making a video for the first time, or doing an interview, it normally is accompanied for most of us by a certain level of fear or hesitation. Now, I know you as courageous, so I'm curious, was that ever an issue for you, or were you so driven by the mission you were okay? Lee, I was so driven that no, I, it's, it's, like, it's like I had tunnel vision. And <laughs> I mean, no, I, I, I just knew I, it was, I just knew this is what I, because how everything unfolded, mm. how, how people came into my life to make it happen. And it was, I was so aligned. Of course, there were some course corrections, but that's all part of it. Yeah. No, I, no. So Rebecca, schizophrenia is something that I think is still fairly taboo uh, and and more perhaps taboo just because it it hasn't touched as many people's lives as perhaps other issues. So for anyone who is completely new to schizophrenia, could you perhaps give us a little bit of an overview of how it shows up, how it manifests in someone's life or perhaps how it manifested in Cole's life? I can speak from my brother's um, experience. In high school, he was isolating a lot and very quiet, wouldn't engage in doing activities or whatever. And then as time went on, when he went to college, that's when it hit. Usually it hits around 21 years old when they have a traumatic experience in their life. Now, yes, my brother did have a lot of traumatic experiences in his life, but I think it hit him at the age of around 21 and he dropped out of college and he, that's, and then he just definitely disappeared. Didn't engage with any of us. Uh, You could tell something was going on, but back then we really weren't sure. Mm -hmm. Um, And yes, he was hearing voices, but not all the voices were hallucinations. Mm. And we speak about this in the film. And this is um, something I would like to say that with my brother's experience, I definitely believe that he could pick up people's um, feelings, that he could definitely sense something was going on um, and in the film, we're interviewing him. And this is what's the first time I heard about this. He said he was under a bridge and he heard this voice come over to him. And the voice said, I'm going to have to take your mother. And two weeks later, my mother died by suicide. And he goes, isn't that something? Isn't that really something? I never told Becky. He called me Becky that. And that was the first I heard about that. Now, mind you, he was not on medication. Hmm. So to me, it's like I definitely had a sense that he was tapping into something higher than I think we can tap into. I wouldn't say everybody who has schizophrenia has that capability, but I definitely believe my brother did. That was of his of his of his wiring yes yeah. absolutely and that's what captivated me so much about him i <clears throat> i wanted to like get into his brain to really understand him and in the film too he also talks about um having a soul contract that he signed excuse me not a soul contract he signed a contract when he was in the psychiatric ward mm. and i understood it but I don't think a lot of people understood it mm. he said, because I asked him, I said, okay, you, what'd the contract say? And he said, you wouldn't understand it. It's not in English. It's in a different translation. So there's something there that, and, and I, that's, I'm doing a lot of research on that right now about. Do you think there's a tendency in our society that if somebody gets the label of schizophrenic or anything with that kind of label, all of a sudden that label becomes how that person is seen? 
So oh, it's almost like anything else is dismissed. It's like, oh, well, they're schizophrenic, so that can't be real. Whereas, of course, their schizophrenia is a part of their life or, an, uh, you know, yeah. Yeah, they're cra- he's crazy. They, they're, they're hearing voices. Well, those voices, yes, they're hearing voices. Mm-hmm. But what are their voices saying? Mm-hmm. Give yeah. them a chance. Say, okay, I know you're hearing voices. And so talk to me about those voices. I have found when we went to film festivals, Carl would sit up on the stage with me and he would engage in the audience. He loved it. And I have found a lot of people with this illness are extremely creative, Mm -hmm. very intelligent, and they can live a very functional life. Some have to have medication, but some have recovered and they don't have to be on medication. They can live a very highly functional life. And that's the sad thing about it because they're, this all of a sudden, oh, you got schizophrenia. And then some people may associate it with a gun. You know, I hate to say that, but that's part of it. That's part of the judgment. Well, fear and judgment are like that, aren't they? If, if, if a person's fear activates, they, you, you don't think clearly. You tend to think from a defensive, reactive, fear-based place. So, you, you know, you'll jump to conclusions that, that support the feeling of fear in your body. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's interesting you mentioned the medication because during the course of the, f- the film, we see, um, we see him go through periods yeah. where he was very over-medicated and you managed to sort that out for him. But when he wasn't over-medicated, the, you know, Gentle Giant is, is one way that he appears, but what I really felt about him watching him was this huge aura like he he just had this big aura and it's not that he was always you know extrovert but you could just feel his level of auric sensitivity he you yeah. know very present very sensory very very sensory in a way that most of us are taught to shut down dumb down um or close down and so i found that very interesting thank you for validating that lee that's what i saw in him too it was almost like when we go into grocery stores together, I, I wish I had a camera on me. But it was like people would c- just come up and say hello to him and just kind of gravitate. You're right. He did. He had this aura about him. He looks like Santa Claus. Mm-hmm. Um, but he was a very compassionate person. Mm. Very wise. Didn't say a whole lot, but listened and observed. Yeah. And, and it's interesting that you say that the biggest trigger for him seemed to be the suicide of your mother. Was that something that you had perhaps, I don't think anyone ever foresees suicide, but did your mother give indications that she had suicidal tendencies or was it, was it a complete shock for all of you? Um, when my father and mother were married in their younger um, years before, I think Ka was maybe a year, she tried and she was in the psychiatric ward several times Mm. had a lot of um oh gosh what do you call it um shock treatment like 96 different shock treatments i think she was just so torn with her voices Mm. but she was also a very creative very loving human being and they didn't know enough back then i If she was still alive today, God, I I just know that she would persevere and, but. Yeah. Yeah. So Rebecca, I know that you have been in a position in your life, which is fantastic to do a lot of philanthropy work, which is great. Are there, is there an area that you're very passionate about right now? I know, I know it's been a few different areas for you, but I'm wondering is there anything really up for you right now where you would like to give your attention and your support? Yeah, um, it's NANCA. It's Baba Mall's organization in Africa. Mm-hmm. And um, it's, he's like the voice of Africa. And it's all about their agriculture and bringing um, awareness for women. Mm. Um, and 
I just absolutely love that organization, and he is such a, an amazing individual. Um, and the other forefront for me is probably Beverly and Derek Jobert. They live in South Africa. They have a conservation called Great Plains. And um, one of the philanthropy works that I did was um, donate a lot of money to save the rhinos mm. and um, because they were extinct. And so um, that animals, <laughs> animals is. And do those, do those causes, because I know you as a very feeling and intuitive person, like do you, is there something that just gets you that you feel? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It just comes. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm. Yeah. So what are the next steps for you? You're making this new documentary. Has that started yet? Is that in production or? Uh, we're three months into it. We're doing a lot of research. And um, so, and then there's another project I have on the side too, but that is like two weeks in, into it right now. So I really don't want to reveal a whole lot, but okay. yes. So um, stay tuned. <laughs> we will. We will. That's great. It's not wrapped around mental illness, schizophrenia. That's, mm. that's it. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, like if, if you had seen where you are today, in, we're filming this in 2020. So let's say in 2010, mm -hmm. you were given a snapshot of your life today and what you're doing. Uh, would it surprise you? Or does it feel exactly what you were heading towards? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, yes and no, because I just follow what, 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 what I feel, what, mm -hmm. what my soul is telling me. So, no, not really. I, I just, I think how it all evolved, yes. Um, I never would have thought it took 14 years, um, you know, to do a film. I thought in a year. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, I just go with it. I, 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 that's the best way I can explain it. I just, no, yeah. So if you had a wish for the trajectory of your journey, in the next 10 years of your life. So 2030, what would you like to have? Two questions. What would you like to have experienced in the next 10 years in your journey? And what would you like to bring more of to the world in the next 10 years? So let's yeah. uh, answer the first question. I'd love to travel more. I love culture. I love immersing myself on how different people live. Mm. Um, and to me, that just, I just thrive on that. I, I, I love that. Um, and the answer to your second question is to give people hope. Don't give up. To give people hope. And just, even though you're going through chaotic times and it's very difficult. It's a gift. Unwrap it and do something creative with it. Mm. Mm. Which I think you have done beautifully. Oh, well, so, thank you. Rebecca, thank you for your work in the world. Thank you for making a sister's call because as a viewer of that film, even knowing, you know, the story that I knew and some things I didn't know, it was incredibly moving and enlightening for me. And I know it has been for so many other people. And I, I hope anyone tuning in to watch this or listen to this will go and check it out. Thank you, Lee. And thank you so much again for having me. It, this was fun. I loved it. I loved having conversation with you. Well, <laughs> you're wonderful. So thank you. And for anybody who wants to check out more of what Rebecca is doing, you can go to rebeccashaper.com. We will put links on this episode page and you can find the film A Sister's Call or the book on Amazon and all good outlets. Thanks so much, Rebecca. Lots of love. Thank you. Lots of love to you too, Lee. 
Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of Impact the World. And if you want to go deeper and more in depth with my work, you should check out my members group, The Portal. You can find it at my website, leeharrisenergy.com or visit theportal.world.